I just need to post this link. Mm -hmm. So, um, you're, I think you've got like one and a half hours or so. Mm -hmm. yeah. The only problem is, so the recordings automatically stop after 40 minutes. So after okay. 40 minutes, I'll just run down. You just keep going with the lecture. Yeah, yeah, I'll yeah, set yeah. it up. Is that okay. all good? Yeah, that's cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right, cool. We should be good to go. Um, only thing, as I said before, is whenever you hit this, yeah, just hit yeah. that as well. Yeah, yeah, sorry, man. It's not no, ideal, that's right, but that's right, that's right. <laughs> the software that we used to use last year just doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, okay. All right. No worries. Um, so is it recording? Sorry? Is it recording? It's recording right now. Okay, um, we'll get started. Um, Uh, so, hello, thank you. My name is John. Um, I'm one of the fourth years. Um, I think this is going to go for one and a half hours, and there's quite a few questions that I've put in here, um, just from past papers. Um, so, let's get started. This is, um, on this side of the screen, that's all the stuff on your matrix, and then this stuff is like OSCE. Sorry, people at home, I'm like annotating on the, you won't be able to see my annotations, but... Um, so I'm, it's sort of interspersed, um, the matrix stuff and the OSCE stuff throughout this presentation. So we're gonna start off with the acute abdomen, which is essentially um, an emergency. You wanna send them to theater as soon as you can. Um, and then after this, we'll go into a more systematic approach um, through the whole GI tract. So essentially, remember these four things. Um, you get severe pain, collapse, shock, peritonitis, um, and then if you get any of this kind of picture in an, OS, in an OSCE or in an EMQ, um, the thing you have to do is to send them to theatre as soon as you can. Um, and these will give you some more localising features to tell you what's actually going on. There's three patterns here. Um, and they're important because they can come up in your EMQs. And to have this sort of approach, this is the top, um, so the, the most common differentials you're going to get for these patterns. So if you get um, severe continuous pain with shock, um, then you want to be thinking about these ones. Ones that are commonly missed are the non-GI ones, like an aneurysm dissection and ectopic pregnancy. Um, if you get sudden onset with peritonitis, then that's a ruptured, a perforated viscous. And these are the three most common things that perforate. Um, peptic ulcer, diverticulitis, appendicitis. And then if you get like constipation with vomiting, and colic, that's probably an SBO, um, which is not an emergency, but if it becomes peritonitic, 
uh, in, that becomes an emergency because it means that it's strangulated or it's perforated. Um, so keep that in mind, especially for the EMQs. So let's go through one now. Um, a man, he takes to clofenac, so an NSAID, um, for two weeks, a sudden onset of severe, epi severe epigastric pain. So rigid abdomen. So we're already getting the pattern here, right? Um, and he's in shock. Um, so what's shown on the x-ray here? Gas under the diaphragm, so pneum pneumoperitoneum. Um, and so what do you think is the most appropriate thing for him? Yeah, laparotomy. Um, so, um, so we'll go into the workup first and then we'll come back to this question. But essentially in a workup um, for an acute abdomen, these are the things you wanna do in pretty much all the patients. Um, so never forget your urine beta HCG. So that's really important to say in an OSCE. Um, uh, you want to do this workup for, so FE, UEC, lipase, CRP, lactate um, in all patients. Um, and then erect chest x-ray. Uh, and then you can mention abdominal x-rays. So we don't really do erect anymore, but um, in an OSCE, they don't take marks away for saying extra things. So you can just say it anyway. Um, and so uh, you can consider a CT abdo on, on, and ultrasound in particular situations. In terms of management, um, this is important to know. Um, so you wanna do your ABC, uh, do fluid resus, um, possibly consider a catheter. Uh, nasogastric if they're obstructed or if they're peritonitic, um, and then antibiotics. And you would also give kefazolin for surgical prophylaxis uh, and then early operation. So if we go back to the question, um, C and E are semi-reasonable it's just that you wouldn't do a CT because um, you kind of already know the diagnosis. It's quite clear and you wouldn't observe because you want to do surgery. But for example, doing IV antis, IV fluids, nil by mouth and nasogastric tubes are all very relevant in this circumstance. But the best answer is still laparotomy. Um, so that's the acute abdomen, um, which kind of covers gastro as a whole. Now we'll just go through each of the different organs, I guess. So the first thing with esophagus is gourd. Um, know your big three uh, big risk factors. So the ones in red. So oh, just to let you guys know, everything in red is stuff I think is clinically relevant and important to remember. Stuff in purple is stuff that I think is um, important for your uh, pathology sort of things, um, EMQs. Um, and these are some triggers um, here. So your foods. So in your management, um, for an OSCE, your lifestyle management a lot of the time will be focusing on the risk factors. So that's your SNAP W. Um, and then in terms of the presentation, the two classic ones are either heartburn or regurgitation for your gourd. If you get these ones down here, so vomiting, anorexia, dysphagia, it means that something, it's like a complication of gourd, okay? And these are the signs that will tell you that you need to do an endoscopy, okay? Otherwise, if they're just heartburn, regurgitation, you don't need to do an endoscopy for them. No for the management, oh, no for the investigations. Um, in terms of the management, um, if they just have reflux, it's pretty stepwise, like antacids, uh, ranitidine, PPI. But if they're severe gourd, then you want to just jump onto an, a PPI, four to eight weeks. And if it's an OSCE, tell them half an hour before a meal. Um, in the morning and then complications these are three important complications to remember um, because they like to test it uh, and test how you apply this knowledge in the emqs um, so it can cause reflux esophagitis um, it can cause a stricture and it can also cause barrett's esophagus um, so let's continue on these are your alarm symptoms which will tell you you need to do an endoscopy so anything unusual really um, but you don't really need to remember that in depth um, so esophagitis, there's a couple main types of esophagitis and different causes. Um, I think the important stuff is the stuff that I've highlighted in a different color. So in terms of reflux esophagitis, that's very straightforward. It, um, it happens because of gourd and it can cause a stricture. But in terms of infectious esophagitis, it doesn't happen in the normal population. It happens in people who are immunodeficient. So especially like the question will say HIV um, or AIDS, um, someone with AIDS. And these are the three pathogens that you get. So HSV, CMV, candida. Um, 
and just you know, know that candida gives you pseudohyphae and the viruses will give you intranuclear inclusions. Um, corrosive isn't too important to know. Drug induced, so I'm sure you guys have done the questions already, but tetracycline comes up a lot, um, but know the others still. So your NSAIDs, doxycycline and bisphosphonates, they can also cause drug induced esophagitis. Eosinophilic, this comes up in your EMQ as an option. I've never seen it as an actual answer though, but something that will differentiate it in the um, stem is that they have food impaction. That's not really something you get with something like gourd, for example. So food impaction and the history of ATP, that's what will give it away. Um, in terms of Barrett's esophagus, so Barrett's um, is a complication of gourd when you get um, acid, uh, inside your esophagus when, when it's not supposed to be there. Um, over a long period of time, that can cause metaplasia. So it's the response to that. And this is just important to know for your pathology, really. So it goes from simple columna, which is normal epithelium, to the stratified squamous. squamous. Um, and you get goblet cells, which is cells that are supposed to be in your small intestine. And it, yeah, this has come up in a question before. So just remember the purple stuff. Um, you can, the most common complication from Barrett's um, and reflux esophagitis is that it can cause a stricture, but the most concerning one is that it can cause um, adenocarcinoma. So adenocarcinoma is um, it de it's derived from glandular tissue, and in your esophagus you don't normally have glandular tissue. So the only way you're going to get adenocarcinoma is if you get Barrett's esophagus, um, and so a lot of the time they're asymptomatic and in terms of management because of the um, sort of malignant potential you want to do uh, endoscopy surveillance um, and give them a PPI. So that's the main stuff for Barrett's. Um, this is just stuff you have to recognize for your uh, pathology. Um, so in terms of cancer, esophageal cancer there's two types mainly. Um, one is your adenocarcinoma which as we've been talking about comes from Barrett's um, the other type is your SEC, um, which is mainly from, the risk factors are mainly smoking and alcohol, um, and they happen in your middle third, whereas the Barrett's, uh, because adenocarcinoma comes from Barrett's, um, that'll affect your lower third. Um, the presentation, so this is important to know, um, it can cause progressive dysphagia because the cancer is essentially slowly growing, and so you can swallow less and less. Um, the loss of weight is associated with that because you can eat less. Um, and odinophagia is a concerning sign as well. You shouldn't really get that with things like gourd. Um, if you get cough and hoarseness, that's related to the complications. Um, so that's if you get like recurrent laryngeal nerve invasion or tracheal invasion, um, that will give you your other symptoms. Um, it can also give you IDA. So a lot of these cancers, gastric, esophageal, colorectal carcinoma, they will give you um, your iron deficiency anemia. Um, Okay, so that's the main stuff from esophageal cancer. Um, these things come up quite a bit. So Mallory Wise um, is from uh, vomiting a lot, and then you eventually get hematemesis. Borhav is uh, even worse, and the thing that will separate it in a question is that you get hemodynamic collapse because um, it actually tears through. The most common cause of Borhav is endoscopy, but a lot of the time I think they like to just go for the retching um, because at least in an EMQ, it seems very similar to Mallory Wise. So the things that will differentiate it is the hemodynamic collapse. Um, so these are other things. It's not too important to know, um, but it just comes up sometimes in your EMQs um, as an option. So the main thing to remember from this um, is the difference between your motility and your obstructive ones. So most of the things we've been talking about so far is your obstructive, where you um, will get dysphagia to solids um, first, and then if it gets severe enough, it can become progressive dysphagia to liquids as well. Motility, you get um, dysphagia to both solids and liquids at the same time, because um, it's not pushing well enough. It's a dysmotility. So achalasia, um, it's when uh, you don't really, the esophagus isn't really pushing, and then um, the lower esophageal sphincter isn't relaxing, and so you get um, regurgitation of undigested food. Um, Crest syndrome, that's more of a rheumatology thing, but um, it's come up in one of our via questions um, where it was essentially someone with tight skin um, and difficulty swallowing. 
So it's just something to recognize um, and that can cause a motility disorder. And dis uh, diffuse esophageal spasm, it's not too important, but it can give you like heart pain that mimics AMIs. Um, pharyngeal pouch, this comes up as an option in your EMQs. I think the main thing to know is that you get a little pouch at the back of your throat. You can get a sense of a lump in your throat and it can give you halitosis and regurgitation of undigested food as well. Um, this is just an approach to dysphagia. I think it's very unlikely that you'll get an in an OSCE, but these are just good questions to ask if you have enough time to go through it. Um, so let's go through some questions. So obese man, smoker, alcohol, retrosternal burning chest pain, occurs mainly at night. Um, what's the most likely diagnosis? Good, yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, he probably has severe gourd, and so the ranitidine isn't cutting it, and so you need to give him a PPI. And he's got the risk factors of being a smoker, alcohol, and obese. Um, okay, so worsening dysphagia over a period of several months, smoking alcohol reflux esophagitis, uh, what's the most likely diagnosis? So I think SEC, yeah, I think the toss up is between Barrett's and SEC, but Barrett's is typically asymptomatic unless it causes a benign stricture. Um, so I think you would consider, is this a benign stricture or is this SEC? Um, I think the main thing here uh, is that it's happened over a, over a period of several months, which is quite fast. Um, I think that's the main thing that pushes you towards an SEC, um, but obviously you still have your um, risk factor of smoking and alcohol, which is classic of SEC. Um, okay, so same patient, um, what further feature will most likely support the diagnosis of an SEC? E, did someone say? Um, I think I heard an E. Um, yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is more of like an ENT, the A is more of like a, an ENT or neuro sort of presentation. Neck bulges, um, that's also upper. Um, pain is intermittent. Um, that's not very typical of uh, SEC. Regurgitation is more of a dysmotility sort of thing. And hoarse voice, as we said before, is uh, a complication. So recurrent laryngeal nerve invasion. Um, so, uh, blood streak vomiting and tetracycline. Esophagitis. And so what are your other ones, other causes of drug-induced esophagitis? Yeah, okay. All of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. I didn't really hear it, but yeah. <laughs> um, so HIV, low CD4, pseudohyphae. Candida, yeah, what are your other causes of um, infectious esophagitis? CMV, HSV, so these ones, yep, okay. So upper gastrointestinal hemorrhage, um, this either presents as hematemesis, melina, or both. Um, if you get something like a coffee ground vomiting, that's because the blood is being digested a bit, um, and that's why it comes out as coffee ground. The main differentials to remember for um, this is peptic ulcer, esophageal varices, gastritis, mallory wise. Um, you can also get it from calcinoma and esophagitis as well, uh, as we've gone over. But yeah, these are the main four you have to remember. Peptic ulcer and varices will give you heaps of vomiting, whereas the rest won't. Um, so that's something to know for your EMQs as well. Um, this is management. Um, in case you get it in an OSCE, be able to just rattle this off because a lot of OSCEs um, no matter what system, um, can follow a very similar approach of doing your um, ABC, chucking in two large bore IV cannulas, um, giving, uh, taking bloods, giving fluids and or bloods, putting them, and so this is more for um, upper GI hemorrhage, making them nil by mouth uh, and urgent endoscopy. Um, so in terms of varices, uh, the most common risk factor is alcohol abuse. Um, so essentially, when you get uh, like cirrhosis of the liver, 
um, blood goes into your uh, splenic artery as well as your left gastric, uh, sorry, vein, as well as your left gastric vein. And so that can cause your esophageal varices and it can also cause splenomegaly. Um, so that's something that comes up in ENQs a lot. Um, in terms of your acute management, um, this hasn't really come up before, but it, I guess because it's a green condition, I just put it in here for you to know. Um, you can give terlipressin or octreotide to uh, sort of reduce the, um, bomb, the blood. But the most important thing is that they need an emergency endoscopy. Um, so that's the main stuff from esophageal varices. Uh, in terms of gastritis, um, other than like your NSAIDs and alcohol, um, some other things to know is that if you get burns or CNS injuries or physiological stress, that can also give you gastritis. So essentially, um, the, the reasoning behind it is that you get less blood flow to the uh, stomach and then you get less of a defense mechanism uh, and then you know, something underlying could cause the ulcer. Um, but yeah, it can cause hematemesis, lena iron deficiency. Uh, and then in terms of chronic gastritis, there's two main causes. One is pernicious anemia and one is H. pylori. Uh, which with H. pylori, uh, the two main uh, complications, the two important complications to remember is that it can cause adenocarcinoma and a malt uh, lymphoma. Uh, those are the main things to know for gastritis. Peptic ulcer disease. Um, so the, the main things are, so this is for your pathology. It's a clean punched out sort of ulcer, whereas if it's irregular, and it, if it looks gross, then that's probably malignant. Um, and then your main causes, H. pylori and NSAIDs. If it's NSAIDs, it's probably going to be a gastric ulcer rather than a duodenal ulcer. Duodenal ulcers are exclusively H. pylori and physiological stress as well. Remember that. Um, and yeah, the rest uh, is really stuff that we've gone over with other conditions. So you can tell that a lot of esophagus and um, stomach conditions kind of have similar risk factors and presentations. Um, uh, so the main thing to differentiate it on an EMQ is that gastric ulcers, uh, think about it as when your stomach is full, uh, you get pain. And then when your stomach slash duodenum is empty, you get pain with duodenal ulcers instead. Um, and so gastric ulcers is right after eating, duodenal ulcers is a couple hours after eating when you get the pain, uh, yeah, when you get the pain. Um, this is more of a second year thing, but no left gastric artery and gastroduodenal artery, if you perforate it, that can cause bleeding. Um, and gastric ulcers can cause gastric cancers, but duodenal ulcers don't cause duodenal cancers. Um, that's the main stuff. So this is just here on the left-hand side, if you wanna go into it, if I were you in an OSCE, I would just stick with urea breath test. Uh, it's the simplest uh, and the test that a lot of people go for. Um, remember this, uh, so your triple therapy, ACE, I remember that by. So amoxicillin, clarithromycin, and a PPI, isomeprazole in this case, for seven days. Um, yeah, that's pretty much the main thing to know from this slide. Uh, okay, yeah, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome isn't too important. But maybe just remember, if you get multiple ulcers um, that's resistant to therapy, um, maybe pick this. But I don't think you need to know the rest. Gastric cancer. So um, if anyone over the age of 40 has a new onset dyspepsia, uh, you want to consider cancer. Uh, and the classic features are early satiety. So in all the other things that we've gone over so far, none of the other symptoms have really been early satiety. So if they get early satiety, you want to start considering gastric cancer. Obviously, loss of weight um, and then stuff about the bleeding. So the cow's node, um, yeah, <laughs> that's just a buzzword. Um, and yeah, these are some complications, but not too important because they're pretty nonspecific. Um, and you want to diagnose it by doing a biopsy. Um, so that's the main stuff from this slide. Uh, so this is just some pathology stuff again. Uh, if it's an irregular ulcer and it's um, not diffuse, then it's intestinal type. If it's uh, signet ring cells 
all over the whole um, stomach and it's like a leather bottle and it's hard, then it's the diffuse type. Um, and these ones can metastasize to your ovaries, causing uh, Krukenberg tumors. So I think they like to test this um, on your pathology as well. Um, I think in the past, uh, they've given a question and they're like, how is this spread? And apparently the answer is transylomic spread, but I think it's pretty dubious because uh, the literature these days say lymphatic spread. So I don't know what I would choose, but yeah, that's, that's there if you want to know. Um, so malt lymphoma, the main thing from that is H. pylori. Uh, <laughs> this is in your <laughs> matrix, but I don't think it's so important. The carcinoid and gist, uh, don't worry about it. This is here uh, for you to practice later on, uh, consenting for a gastroscopy, um, but I won't go over it now. You can read it. So let's do some questions. So uh, vomiting blood, uh, two glassfuls with some clots, um, ibuprofen uh, and pred. So what do you think is going on? Peptic ulcer. Um, okay, good. So the main thing here is the two glassfuls, that's heaps. And so what are your two differentials for massive hematemesis? Peptic ulcer and yeah, <laughs> so esophageal varices, yeah, perfect. Um, and the rest you don't really consider. Okay, so I've only got blah, blah, Two glassfuls, hep C, diabetes, uh, and spleen tip can be palpated. So what's this? Varices, good, okay. Um, Boning blood, this time it's two spoons, so not as much, uh, and left supraclavicular lymph node. Yeah, cancer. Okay, um, coffee ground vomiting. So that means it's a slow bleed. Uh, NSAIDs and non-specific like, non stuff. What's going on here? Gastritis? Yeah, nice. Um, so yeah, coffee ground vomiting, uh, you wanna think about gastritis. Um, it's getting like digested in there. Um, okay, uh, irregular heaped up margin, what is this? Uh, what type of cancer? Ad uh, adenoid carcinoma? Yeah, okay, great. Um, diffuse, what's this? Yeah, signet cell? Yeah, um, so I guess in your cell, uh, you, that's your mucin, where is this? Uh, that's this. So mucin is in the cell and the nucleus is pushed out to the side and that's what is the signet ring. <laughs> Um, okay, so relatively constant upper abdo pain, loss of weight, uh, smokes, drinks, early satiety, uh, very pale. Cancer? Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, so he's probably got uh, iron deficiency anemia as well, feels tired and very pale. Uh, lethargy. Um, okay. Good. And notice that this is a pretty fast history, a three month history. Um, so someone in ICU, that's the main thing, ICU uh, with dysphagia and blood, uh, what's the most likely cause? <laughs> I'm not hearing, I, I think, peptic ulcer, yeah. Um, so as we were talking about before, one of the causes of peptic ulcer is um, physiological stress. And so in the question, they'll be hospitalized or people in ICU um, with hematemesis. Okay, so that's pretty much all the stuff you need to know for esophagus and stomach. Um, we'll go into the pancreas now. Um, so um, acute pancreatitis, I think the main things to remember in terms of the causes are gallstones, alcohol, and idiopathic. Um, don't worry about the smash part. Um, and in terms of presentation, very classic, you know, sudden severe onset pain going right, to, uh, epigastric pain radiating right through to the back, relieved by sending forward. Um, and these are the tests you'll do. So I think in terms of um, OSCEs, 
yeah, a lot of the tests, um, because they don't really deduct marks, I would just say them all. <laughs> um, so in any sort of epigastric pain, you can pretty much say the same investigations and you'll be fine. Um, okay, so in terms of complications, um, you know, acute, pancreatitis, acute pan pancreatitis is really nasty. Like it can give you this, what we call uh, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, I think it says, um, but it's essentially a non-infectious septic picture. So they're really unwell. Um, they get fluid everywhere. Um, and that's why it's so important uh, to pick this up. Um, in terms of late complications, it can cause like a pseudocyst. Um, and this can be best picked, uh, it's first picked up on an ultrasound, but CT is the gold standard. Oh, I'm going to march. Yeah. Remember this, that it can cause a pseudocyst. It normally happens a month what? afterwards. Okay. So that's a long term okay. complication. Um, and then this is, cool. uh, yeah. in terms of management, it's stuff we've already covered. Um, but yeah, just know that um, really well. So there's, you don't really do surgery for what? them. Uh, and you don't really do antibiotics for them what? either. You just supportive right, therapy, yeah. unfortunately. Um, so chronic pancreatitis, um, the, the main thing is alcohol consumption. No, 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 um, no. And they're usually asymptomatic. Uh, the two complications, so if you want to think about the pancreas, um, you have your uh, endogenous as well as your exogenous functions. Oh, sorry, your endocrine and your exocrine functions. Um, in terms of your exocrine, uh, that will give you your malabsorption. Uh, so all your enzymes and stuff. In terms of your endocrine, that'll give you diabetes. So those are things to remember. Um, and so with acute pancreatitis, you don't really do um, X-ray or CT to diabetes um, because you won't see much. Um, but in chronic pancreatitis, you can because it'll cause calcification. Um, and then the main stuff, there's not much to do for management other than lifestyle things and you can consider giving them a pancreatic enzyme, but that's more so relating to exocrine insufficiency. So there's two main causes to remember for pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, other than chronic pancreatitis in adults. If they're a child with this, it's probably cystic fibrosis, and the picture is steatorrhea um, because of fat malabsorption and loss of weight because of fat malabsorption. Okay, um, pancreatic cancer, um, so it's mainly adenocarcinoma. Uh, it's mainly in the pancreatic head. So this can cause um, issues with your biliary tree. So it can give you like your, um, pain, your, your jaundice and your pruritus. Um, but often it presents late. So it gives you um, like your classic um, cancer sort of symptoms, loss of weight, loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, fever. Um, and... Yeah, this is like the kind of buzzword sign, um, Kosovia sign, painlessly distended gallbladder. Um, I don't think there's too much else to know for this. Cholangiocarcinoma is a, a cancer of your biliary tree that presents in a very similar way. Um, okay, so let's do some more questions. So uh, an old man who's a smoker has epigastric pain going to the back, cabbage, doesn't drink, obese okay so what do you think is going on d yeah yeah so this is d um so he's got the his risk factors are old age smoking um cardiovascular stuff and obesity um and fullness in the epigastrium is a classic sort of um, feature of an aortic aneurysm. Um, so you, you might have considered acute pancreatitis, but he doesn't really have the right risk factors for it. Um, if we do the next question, you'll get a good comparison. That's okay, the way. But anyway, 45 year old female, um, BMI is high, uh, same symptom, a lot of vomiting. Uh, and not really a smoker or a drinker. So what do you think is going on? Pancreatitis? 
And what's the what's causing the pancreatitis? Gallstones. So the number one cause is gallstones, and it's the um, female in her forties who's fat um, and has a family history of it. That's like the F's. Um, cool. So cystic fibrosis. What is it? Come on, yeah, okay, and let's go through the rest of the yeah. question. Uh, she has weight loss <laughs> and low vitamin D. So, oh, so what are your vitamins that are implicated in pancreatitis? A, D, E, K? Yeah, cool. Uh, what are the, what, what symptoms might you get with A, D, vitamin A deficiency? What does that give you? Night blindness. Um, vitamin D? Okay. Osteoporosis, yeah. Um, vitamin E, it's not really that important. I think it can give you maybe peripheral neuropathy, I don't know. Uh, vitamin K, bleeding, yeah, awesome, cool. Um, okay, so alcohol, um, severe pain. Ah, uh, oh, but that was a month ago. And now he has a large upper abdo mass. So what's going on? Pseudocyst? Nice. Um, and what, will you, what investigation will you do? Ultrasound? What's the best investigation you can do? CT? Nice. Okay. But that's not an option. So um, That's pretty much pancreas. Uh, we'll do your intestines now. Um, any questions so far? Okay, uh, so acute vomiting. Um, yeah, th these are the sort of things I think about. Um, there's heaps of different causes, but these are the main ones, like the common ones, as well as the uh, things you don't want to miss. So I think about, first of all, your gastrointestinal stuff, so infection and obstruction. And I think about non-gastro stuff, so neuro and then other stuff you can't miss. Um, so... Uh, in terms of your obstruction, it really depends where it is. If it's high up, undigested food. If it's lower down, partially digested food. If it's further, then you might get bile or feces in the vomit. Yeah. Yeah. So acute diarrhea. Um, different textbooks will have different ways of um, classifying it. I think this is the simplest way of understanding acute diarrhea. Um, so you have three types. Um, Invasive is when the bug goes into the gastro, into the bowel, and it causes, um, and it essentially like causes destruction of the bowel, and then that will cause your bleeding. So that's um, dysentery, bleeding, mucus, diarrhea. Um, secretory is when they um, sort of stimulate the bowel wall um, to secrete um, some. They secrete like chloride and all sorts of different um, electrolytes and then water follows that. So that's isotonic and that will give you high volume diarrhea because the water is actually going into the poo. Um, and so your classic ones are senna, senna for stimulation um, or secretory stimulation. Uh, enterotoxins, so three important things that um, will give this picture are your cholera, staph aureus and um, traveler's diarrhea, so enterotoxigenic. E. coli. Um, and then osmotic, um, that's because something non-absorbable inside, is inside the bowel and water follows that. Um, so the main thing for that is your malabsorption, lactose uh, intolerance, and your laxatives. Um, so, yeah. These are some other differentials to think about. Um, I think in an OSCE, if you were to get diarrhea, they'd probably say like diarrhea plus something else, like diarrhea and fever or diarrhea in a recently returned traveler, that kind of stuff. Otherwise, there's just too much uh, to cover. So let's go through gastroenteritis. Um, I've pretty much just put in the important buzzwords. Um, for your viral, it will give you watery diarrhea. Um, and the two main ones are your norovirus and your rotavirus. Norovirus is more so in adults. Rotavirus is in children and kindergarten workers, kindergarten um, teachers. Um, that's pretty much all you have to know for this. Um, in terms of your 
um, bacterial gastros that give you watery diarrhea. So these are the things that are not your dysentery ones. Um, so the things that give you your secretory. So um, I think these are the main ones to know. Uh, obviously there are others, but they're rarer. Um, so C. diff, um, antibiotics. You wanna do, uh, this comes up quite a bit. So first line is Metro, second line is Vank. And remember that's oral for both. Um, IV doesn't have good penetration. Um, in terms of your bacillus cereus, cereus sounds like cereal, and that reminds me of rice. Um, so, yeah. um, and then cereus and staph aureus, they are enterotoxins, and so they will cause diarrhea pretty much immediately, within a few hours. Um, the most common presentation is actually vomiting, uh, so keep that in mind. Um, and then clostridium, um, I don't think it's too important, but uh, it can cause uh, hemorrhagic necrosis of the bowel. Um, cholera is your classic rice water stools. Um, this is your traveler's diarrhea, E. coli, watery stools, and listeria is more so in pregnant women. Um, I think that's all the high yield stuff. Um, so dysentery, how you remember it is chess. Um, so campylobacter and H stands for E. heck. Uh, which is your enterohemorrhagic E. coli. Um, Chess C H E is your entamoeba, which is a parasite on the next page. And um, that's why I didn't put it here. Um, and then Salmonella and Shigella. So those are your main ones that you have to remember that cause dysentery. Um, so we'll go through them. Campylobacter, uh, the, the, there's just classic sort of buzzword things that comes up all the time, but milk, poultry, or bird droppings. Um, and you give them either azithromycin or cipro. For your EHEC, um, uh, there's, there's not much, it, it's hard to differentiate, but essentially um, they get it after eating uncooked beef and it's more common in children to get this thing called hemolytic uremic syndrome. I don't think it'll come up for you guys because it's more of a peat thing. Uh, salmonella, uh, obviously eggs and chicken um, and watery diarrhea. So, more commonly, it causes watery diarrhea, but it can cause dysentery. That's why it's in this list, okay? So yeah, we'll, we'll go over a question on this later. And Shigella is more so with men who have sex with men in sexual contact, uh, in our EMQs at least. Yeah. Um, so other things that come up, typhoid fever. This was a thing that came up for us last year. Um, they're essentially very unwell. Um, they have high fevers. Uh, and they have what's called a stepwise fever that goes up. Um, and they have abdo pain. Usually they're a traveler from South Asia. Um, and it will give you things like constipation rather than diarrhea. So that's the thing that will separate it from the rest of the options. Um, but it can give you diarrhea in some cases. And they're just extremely unwell. Um, so it, it's usually like the first week you get your fever. Second week you might get constipation or diarrhea. Third week you get bacteremia. Um, these are your protozoa. So entamoeba, um, remember that this is a part of your chest, so it can cause a bloody diarrhea uh, and you get trophozoites when you look at it under a microscope. Um, Giardia, uh, St. <laughs> Petersburg, Russia, India. Um, and the main thing here,